we have a special guest with us today. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and activist, best selling author, has written 12 books, including the uh, latest America the Farewell Tour. There it is. Uh, his work can be found in the New York Times Truth Dig. Please welcome back to the show. It's Chris Hedges. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm good, Jimmy. How are you? Uh, I've been better. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, I'm enjoy- I'm enjoying watching the 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 country get fleeced uh, and the progressive politician standing by and watching it. Can I just get your reaction to what's happening right now with this? Uh, well, not only the coronavirus, but but just the complete impotent rage <laughs> of people like me. Uh, that is, I mean, it's just amazing to watch uh, not only Bernie Sanders, but Elizabeth Warren, but every member of the squad, including Ro Khanna, just completely roll over for the corporate state. And I keep saying, what's the point of electing people who don't take corporate money if they take orders from the people who do? So what is your, what is your take on all this? Well, they've all become part of the club. Uh, Bernie Sanders, by the way, has been a, a longtime member of the club. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the system has made it very clear that either you toe the line, Ocasio-Cortez has decided to do this, mm. Bernie Sanders is doing this. Uh, I mean, I think Ocasio-Cortez announced today she's going to vote for Biden. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and if you don't toe the line, you're out. Uh, you know, there's a very, uh, stark, uh, kind of division between, uh, critics of corporate capitalism uh, who actually mean it and stand for something like Ralph Nader, uh, and those who mouth the appropriate words, but in their actions, essentially buttress the corporate state. And, and that would include, you're, you're right, the squad along with Bernie Sanders. Yeah. So when you stand up for people, like if, if when you stand up for um, the people who are being kicked out of their house and you stand up to Wall Street, really stand up to them. And if you really stand up to the corporate state, what is going to happen is you're going to be treated just like those people, the corporate state, are disappearing. And that is the one thing Bernie Sanders is not willing to do. He is not willing to be treated the same way Ralph Nader is treated. Isn't that correct? Well, that, I know that's correct, because in 2016, I did an event with Bernie Sanders uh, before the climate march, and Shama Sawant, the Socialist City Councilwoman, was there. And she pressed Bernie uh, about running as an independent, uh, arguing correctly that we were never going to build an effective political movement within an election cycle, that the Democratic Party would never give him the nomination, and that they would use him as a sheepdog for Clinton. Uh, And uh, that's exactly what happened. Then Bernie spent four years, instead of building a real opposition movement, acting as a lackey to Schumer. Uh, And remember, the power of Schumer and Pelosi is that they funnel all the Wall Street and corporate money to the anointed candidates. Uh, He runs again. uh, And now, of course, he's uh, endorsing Joe Biden. Uh, And I think it is political cowardice. Um, Either I mean, he must have been incredibly naive uh, to think the Democratic Party was ever going to give him a shot, even though he was kind of uh, a loyal poodle for those four years. Uh, uh, and, And I think it's coupled with the fact that he knows the cost. He does know the cost because right. he told she told Sawan myself that he didn't want to end up like Nader. And he's not wrong. I mean, they would have destroyed him. They right. would have gone after a Senate seat. They would have discredited him. He wouldn't have, he, you know, he caucuses as a Democrat. He has seniority and all of that would have been gone. He would have become a pariah. The MSNBC crowd and everybody else would have uh, crucified him uh, day in and day out. Uh, all, although they did a pretty good job of red baiting Bernie, even when he was running. Uh, so... Yeah, that that that's the price. Bernie didn't want to pay the price. Uh, and uh, and here's where we are. And so I just want to make clear, because you hear this constantly. What is frustrating me is in the progressive news space, people are constantly making excuses for Bernie, saying he's too nice. He doesn't have a killer instinct. Mm-hmm. And what I keep trying to point out to them is, no, Bernie is acting in his own self-interest. This is not because he's too nice. This is because Bernie knows exactly the cost of doing what, what he is supposed to do, and he is unwilling to do it. And the cost of what he's supposed to do, which is like put a hold on one of these horrible stimulus bills and tell, explain to everybody exactly what's going on and what the problem is, and the problem is Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, it, it, for him to do that, the cost of that would be exactly all those things you said, and he's not willing to do that. So in a sense, he's selling 
us out, and he's really not even getting anything. He's just getting a Senate appointment and people being nice to him. I, it, that sounds almost crazy, but that's exactly what's. If you look at every decision he's made uh, since 2016, which completely frustrates all of his supporters, they're like, why doesn't he fight back? Why doesn't he say this? Why doesn't he do that? Why doesn't he point out? Why? And if you look at it through the lens of he doesn't want to be Ralph Nader, everything he does makes perfect sense. But if you look at it through the lens of he wants to win the election, it doesn't make any sense. And it's because he wasn't willing to do what it took to win the election. And let me just quote you, if I can. You wrote an article called Et to Bernie, and you did that, I think, in 2018. And um, here's some of it. Let me just read some of it. It says, there are two versions of Bernie Sanders. There is the old Bernie Sanders who mounted a quixotic campaign for the Democratic presidential nomination as a Democratic socialist who refused corporate cash and excoriated corporate Democrats. And there is the new Bernie Sanders who dutifully plays by the party rules, courts billionaires, refuses to speak out in support of the lawsuit brought against the Democratic National Committee for rigging the primaries against him, and endorses Democratic candidates who espouse the economic and political positions he once denounced. Sanders, although he knew by September 2016 that the process was rigged, said nothing to his supporters. He was tacitly complicit in the cover-up. It was left to, no, to one of the architects of the fraud, Donna Brazil, to reveal the scam. But by then, it was too late. Sanders' capitulation in the face of the overwhelming evidence of the rigging of the nomination process was political and moral cowardice. He missed his historical moment, one that should have been should have seen him denounce a corp, corrupt, corporate-dominated party elite and walk away to build a third-party candidacy. Sanders will never recover politically. Those who support Sanders' capitulation, including his high-priced establishment consultants, will argue that politics is about compromise and the practical. This is true, but playing politics in a system that is not democratic is about becoming part of the charade. We need to overthrow this system, not placate it. Revolution is almost always a doomed enterprise, one that succeeds only because its leaders eschew the practical and are endowed with what the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr calls sublime madness. Sadners lacks this sublime madness, the quality to find Eugene Debs, and for this reason, Sanders is morally and temperamentally unfit to lead this fight. Those are strong words, but I think everything you said is absolutely true, and I remember the first time I read it, I don't remember it because I blocked it out. And so then I reread it and then I was like, God, I read this before, and how come I don't remember any of it? And it had to be because I blocked it out. And do you think that a lot of people are blocking this out? Uh, and because it just seems that uh, in the face of un, uh, utter jaw-dropping betrayal from our elected leaders, including Bernie Sanders, the progressive movement or the progressive news space is doing what I did and just denying it. Yeah, because Bernie was the political savior. Uh, and he was endowed with, and, and when we when we build a political savior we endow that savior with all kinds of qualities uh, that person usually doesn't have and that's precisely what happened i mean the tragedy about bernie is that i actually think he does care about labor uh, i think these commitments are real uh, i don't think he's as far as i can tell uh you know corrupt uh but he he lacks the uh fortitude to go up against this monolithic machine because he understands how destructive and brutal it is, and so he's he has capitulated, and and I think he's certainly astute enough to know that he's capitulated. I mean, that's why he didn't go after Biden during the campaign. Uh, I mean, the story is that Jane Sanders, uh, who has a very powerful influence within the campaign or had, uh, likes the Bidens, and and again, it's you know who it goes right back to C. Wright Mills. You know, he, he talks about how our professors brought into tenure has nothing to do with their academic ability. It has to do whether or not they're clubbable. And, and Bernie wants to be clubbable. It's, it's, and so do you see, and I don't see, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm putting all my focus now into trying to highlight people who are good at direct action and unions 
And we had on Jane uh, McLevy, uh, which whose video we're going to drop today. And she lays out step by step how you organize a good 90 percent strike. And what we need to do is we need to because going far. I mean, it's just Bernie Sanders, AOC. They are Obama 2.0. There is no doubt. They are there. They will go along with the corporation no, no matter what. If they're told to, they're revealing it. Because right now, AOC is doing live streams where she rants about the bill, but she only rants against the Republicans. She doesn't rant against the person who has the power in the House, which is Nancy Pelosi. That's true, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, right. So the night I did that event with Bernie and Shama, uh, there were other people there, Bill McKibben, Naomi Klein, and everybody was going after the Koch brothers. And as soon as Shama and I went after Obama's record, environmental record, uh, the other panelists were angry. I mean, in fact, attacked us for being partisan. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, that this is so, so you build your kind of moral stature uh, by denying the complicity of the Democratic establishment, tagging the Republican establishment. But in fact, who are you serving? You're not serving the American public. You're not serving truth. You're serving the Democratic Party hierarchy. That, and that's just what you know, that that's kind of what's so sad about what's happened. Uh, but I, I never, uh, you, you know, I, I, I never for a moment thought that Sanders was going to get the nominations in 2016. Uh, and we know all the dirty tricks, which you have done a good job laying out. I never thought that they would allow him to get the nomination now. Uh, and we saw that with Obama interceding. Uh, the fact that they would push it to a second vote, he wouldn't get enough delegates. They'd bring in all the super delegates, which could vote on the second round. Um, it was never ever going to happen, and and that's the tragedy. And I think the, the, that what happened is you've had many many people. Although I, I would argue a, a lot of the the, the really progressive uh, campaign workers and and supporters in 2016, after they saw uh, Sanders holding rallies. On behalf of Hillary Clinton, by the way, you know he'd get a few hundred people at those rallies, where before he was getting ten thousand, walked away and didn't come back in this election. Um, and and that despair and that disillusionment, um, I hope, doesn't translate into political apathy. I hope it translates into wisdom, um, which is the Democratic Party is incapable of reform. Uh, this corporate state is incapable of reform, uh, and we have to begin to mobilize to cripple it and bring it down. And so the way we mobilize, and I mean, this is real, because I don't think, because, uh, so what I keep saying is the reason why I'm the only one screaming like a maniac into a camera about what's happening right now is because those other people don't fully realize what's about to happen right now. Um, you think that's the case? Because I don't think people realize what this country is going to look like in a year or two after the economy, quote unquote, opens back up. And everything is just, you know, at, uh, owned by a handful of people, which is already was. Uh, now it's going to be even more. So go ahead. I'll just let you talk about it. Well, I think it's a mixture. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I think political cowardice is not the wrong word. Stepping outside the system and challenging it immediately thrusts you into the wilderness. I've been thrust there myself. Uh, it's uncomfortable. Uh, it's a direct confrontation with the security and surveillance state, uh, and it requires acts of sustained mass civil disobedience, which are at best uncomfortable and can get you arrested uh, and, and will certainly get you followed by the internal organs of security. Uh, and a lot of people just don't want to go there. Uh, and you're right about where we're headed, because this will be a collapsing house of cards. Uh, you know, they, you will have, whether people organize rent strikes or not, is is irrelevant. Uh, there will be de facto rent strikes. Uh, what what happens to the credit card companies? What happens to student loan? Uh, small businesses are already uh, going under right and left, uh, aided of course by the fact that large corporate businesses swallowed up all these uh, loans that were supposed to be given to small businesses to keep their employees employed. I mean, it's been a complete disaster. It's very clear uh, from looking at uh, other countries, especially in Europe that the only way forward is a guaranteed, uh, not minimum, a guaranteed sustainable income, which we're not doing. Uh, you know, we're throwing, what, these checks, which nobody can get, people file for unemployment, the system crashes. Uh, at best, what's that, four months? I mean, we are headed for 
economic catastrophe and the mishandling of the coronavirus. The, the, I mean, in essence, the, 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 the corporate oligarchs have made a choice, and it's a very grim choice. Um, they're certainly astute enough to know that in order to tackle the virus, there has to be sustained, prolonged uh, control, testing, shutdown. But that's so detrimental to their profits that they are going to sacrifice thousands, tens of thousands of American citizens on the altar of greed. They would rather have them die. Uh, and that's what's going to hit. Uh, because uh, they we're already watching these absurd calls to reopen, what is it, May 1st? I, I can't remember the newest date. It used to be Easter. Um, uh, and, and, they, and they, they, you know, the, 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 the tragedy is that the most vulnerable, the low-wage workers, you know, those who uh, actually do real work rather than sitting around like parasites on Wall Street are the ones who are uh, getting this right and left. So, uh, economically, socially, uh, there certainly will be turbulence and unrest. I don't see how that's avoidable. My fear is that it doesn't have a vision. If you have kind of spontaneous uprisings here and there, uh, the state can crush it. Um, but, but empower those uprisings with a vision against corporate power and a kind of a socialist and a call for socialism, uh, that becomes very dangerous. And I think, Jimmy, that's Part of the reason that people like you and myself and Ralph and uh, Max Blumenthal and Shama Sawan and all sorts of others have been uh, not just pushed to the margins of the media landscape, but uh, have been, I've certainly been a victim of these algorithms that Google and Twitter and Facebook have imposed since 2017. And that's not conjecture because at, before I was fired from TruthDig a few weeks ago uh, for going on staff, a strike with the staff when the publisher tried to fire the editor-in-chief, Bob Shear, um, we saw how, you know, they're called impressions. So if you typed in imperialism in Google and I'd written an article recently on imperialism, it would come up. Now there's no references. So the referrals by impressions over a 12-month period had, had fallen from over 700,000 to below 200,000 as they perfected the algorithms. And that's because the elites no longer have a counter argument. Nobody is buying their neoliberal mantra, which never made any economic sense at all. Uh, it, it was, you know, drawn from these half-wits and, and marginally and totally discredited people, figures like Hayek, Frederick Hayek, or Ayn Rand, imagined. Uh, it, it, but it did make sense as an ideology to uh, consolidate the wealth and power of the oligarchic elite, which is why it was rammed down our throats. But left, right, Trump supporters, nobody's buying it. And so those who have a serious critique of it become dangerous before they were, you know, shunted aside and kind of ignored. But now there's a very active effort to shut those voices down. So th this started uh, very publicly and famously with Alex Jones. Of course, they pick out somebody who's, you know, universally uh, offensive uh, and and at the same time, they were doing things like what they're doing. You, you're, you're describing the the real uh, opponents of the corporate state. Uh, they were also deplatforming and deranking as far as Google algorithms and searching stuff and Facebook uh, taking away their p platform. They, they took away 800 lefty liberal uh, Facebook pages and nobody cared. In fact, I worked at the Young Turks and the management there cheered it on as they were pushing Russiagate at the same time. And if I didn't know better, I would like, are you guys being paid to undermine the left? Because that's what it seems like. Well, is, 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 it, is it stunning to you how people who can be active in the political media left space cheer on censorship and Russiagate? No. Uh, go back and read, uh, you know, Emma, Emma Goldman or Randolph Bourne. A look at what happened at the... Uh, when Wilson created the Committee for Public Information and massive censorship uh, and, you know, those few stalwarts, Debs, of course, Eugene Debs was another one who held out, uh, held fast, uh, wrote how, how swiftly under pressure all these, I'm talking about socialists, uh, you know, embrace the censorship and, and the war effort that Wilson was pushing. Uh, and then those people with any kind of moral fortitude, people like Debs, uh, are uh, – Debs was imprisoned. Uh, Joe Hill was killed. Big Bill Haywood had to flee the country. 
uh, Emma Goldman had to was deported along with Alexander Berkman and 300 other leftists. Uh, so I think history bears out that under pressure, uh, it's actually a, a very small number of radicals who hold fast to the truth and who are willing to defy power. We can't we can't even get a news person to call out Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> we can't even get a news person, let alone a politician. Uh, it's un, it's it's crazy the world we're living in. And, you know, uh, let's talk, you know, very briefly about uh, what happened to you at Truth Dig. So uh, explain to me what happened. So there was this news site, Truth Dig. You wrote on it. Lots of great writers. Bob Shear, uh, famous from Ramparts. And he he. Uh, was the editor of that. Now it's, I guess, bankrolled by a billionaire heiress. My question is why do you people still need ba- billionaire heiresses to bankroll them? Uh, can I just go to your webpage and get your, first of all, tell us what happened at truth dig. And then we'll go to, we'll take the next step. Right. So it was founded by this heiress. You correctly point out as Wade Kaufman and Bob Shear. Uh, and they were co-owners. Bob was the editor in chief. Uh, and she did bankroll it. Um, and that's because everyone was paid on the site. Um, so people weren't submitting. And that was Bob was adamant that he wasn't going to take free work from writers. He's he's a writer. And uh, for whatever, I think because Bob was so fierce in denouncing the Russiagate hoax uh, and the red baiting against Bernie, he kind of fell out of favor with the uh, Santa Monica uh, liberal elites. He wasn't the flavor of the month anymore. Uh, and uh, so I don't know what her motives were, but she moved to remove him, to fire him and the staff. We actually took over the site on March 11th, announced a work stoppage and also demanded a union. Uh, imagine that. And, um, and, uh, and, and and an end to abusive labor conditions, including forcing copy desk editors to be on call for you know, several hours, but only paying for them for the time they were actually typing online, uh, writing into contracts that you had to, and, and it's quite a long, exhaustive list uh, to surrender or nullify all of your civil and, and labor rights. Um, and uh, she eventually shut the site down, it's supposedly on hiatus, uh, and fired everyone. Um, and that's, again, a kind of window into the rhetoric of the liberal elites uh, you know, unions are fine for teachers or anybody else, um, but uh, not for your own employees. So, yeah, we all we all lost our we all lost our jobs. So, again, this is another one of those situations where the the owner and the editor and they don't they don't produce the value of that website, just like the uh, okay. the stockholders of Ralph's don't produce the value of a grocery store. It's actually, we were finding out during this pandemic, it's actually the workers who create all the value. Same thing at Amazon, same thing at UPS. It's actually the workers who create. So it's actually the writers at Truth Day that create all the value. Why do you need her? She has the money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the problem is that, you know, the old model of which was flawed, of the press where you depended on advertisers really doesn't work anymore because uh, they don't, advertisers don't need the medium of newsprint or uh, a site to connect with consumers. They have all of our profiles and they can connect with us directly. Uh, And, you know, that's raised some serious questions is how you will sustain journalism going forward. Uh, And to her credit, she did give significant amounts of money. I think the budget was about a million a year. Uh, uh, but in the end of, she tired of it, tired of Bob, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and we're out, we had a good run. I was there for 15 years. I had a column there every week. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm writing a book now, so I don't actually mind the break trying to write a column every week while you're writing a book blows a hole in your book writing. Uh, and it's exhausting. Um, but it does raise questions about, you know, how we're going to do journalism. Bar- Barbara Ehrenreich says journalists are going to have to get used to being members of the working class again. Uh, be, they're not going to get the kind of middle class salaries that I and my colleagues got when I was at the New York Times. That's over. So, yeah, I mean, my advice to <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what it's worth, but my advice going forward would be 
you know, you just set up your own subscription model. All the writers at Truth Dig, everybody wants to read them. So you just create a website and you create a subscription model. That's what we've done. People will support you. Uh, people support us because they know they can get here what they can't get anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And so that's the that that's where the business model is changing. And that's the beauty is that you don't really need them anymore and that people will, can sell fun through pay, Patreon or whatever. We have PayPal. And so that's how uh, we couldn't do this. With In fact, when the adpocalypse happened on YouTube, you know, all our revenue went to zero. And I was like, well, let's see if the people care enough about this to support it. And they did. And so... I'm just I, I I would support you and Truth Dig and I'm sure lots of other people would if you ever decided to do something like that. So uh, that's the beauty. We don't like I see guys like Glenn Greenwald, you know, get get attached to the hip as some billionaire, I and then turns the Intercept into a propaganda machine, uh, puts red baiting McCarthy bullshit, and uh, it's just and, and spreading lies about Syria. Just just another bullshit organization they turn into, and it's like Glenn, you don't need them. I don't know why you feel like you need to be joined to the hip as some billionaire. You don't need them anymore. I can raise you a million dollars to run the truth dig, no problem. Uh, that could happen. So we should probably talk after the show. <laughs> Um, oh, this is this is what Matt Taibbi just did. Um, I, I'm not rushing into anything right now because I want to finish the book, and it's I, I teach and I've been taught yeah. in prisons for ten years, so it's something I care a lot about, and then I'll kind of worry about it. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the. This is the. You teach in a prison, uh, and it's really it's always amazing to see to hear you talk about. It. And here's the play you guys. So you teach in a prison. They you've written a play, that, not you, but the the prisoners. Agent. Yeah. Uh, have written a play and it's called Caged and it's now it's now being uh it's it's called New Jersey Prison Theater Cooperative and it's actually Hay- Haymarket Press is uh, now printing it and um I just want to read some from the um f- from the introduction because the the introduction was from uh uh Boris Franklin or you wrote part of it and then he also wrote and he was one of the prisoners who also had a big hand in writing this. And I just want to read some of it. Uh, And he's referring to you. He said, he, meaning you, asked us to write about our experiences and those of our families outside of prison, as well as our life in prison in dramatic dialogue. We reached back into our past to produce small dramatic scenes. We resurrected emotions and painful experiences, as well as ones of joy and love buried deep within us. Professor Hedges selected several dialogues each week to read out loud, sometimes asking the student who wrote it to read it to the class. There were many times, however, when the pain of what had been put down on paper was too much to speak. Stories of pain, humiliation, humor, love, courage, grief, loneliness, loss, shame, and guilt poured out of us. The emotional walls erected between us and the prison began to crumble. And as we listened to these stories being read out loud, often by men whose voices were breaking with emotion, we began to understand that when you are a poor person of color in America, you have one story. There are many different variations of this story, but the core is the same, one made familiar by white supremacy, poverty, neglect, despair, rage, violence, addictions, and abandonment, telling this story, our story, was liberating. We found our voice. Our voice became the play Caged. So uh, tell me how that, how did that get started? How did you start teaching in the prison and give us the journey? So I originally started teaching because of a friend of mine who was the head of the history department at the College of New Jersey. This was before there was an accredited college program. We would just buy the books ourselves, go in, teach a semester course, and then go home on our computers and print out, if they did the work, a certificate saying they had done the academic work, which had no, was not going to be accepted by any academic institution, but which they could put in their folders, which is helpful when they went up before probation committees or anything else. Uh, Then eventually, 2013, uh, Rutgers University established a a program, a BA program, inside the prison, and I began teaching in that program. Uh, This class was the first class. It was 2013. I was teaching drama, so August Wilson, Amira Baraka, uh, James Baldwin, um, Pinier, all sorts of playwrights. 
And uh, I, as an experiment, had them write dramatic scenes to familiarize them with dramatic dialogue. And I had such strong, I'd attract it because they knew I was a writer, such strong writers, that we eventually hammered it into a play. Uh, and uh, it was uh, put on at the theater in Trenton and then just published by Haymarket Books. Uh, any, I don't think we'll make any money, but any money from the play will go into a, a re-entry fund so that all of those playwrights will have something. I just, as a matter of fact, put down a down payment on an apartment for one of the playwrights who's getting out in June uh, because they come out with nothing. Uh, you know, they get, if they can matriculate to Rutgers, but if they have over a 3.1 average, but then they get there, they can't buy a computer. I mean, stuff like that. So, um, but it was moving and, and in prison, you don't share those experiences. Uh, and I was, it was inadvertent. It wasn't planned on my part, but as Boris said, it became uh, highly charged, highly emotional and highly therapeutic because people began to, uh, speak in, 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 about their own pain, their own loss, their own suffering, their own struggles. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were built a kind of phenomenal connection and bond that has continued to this day. I mean, I met Boris at the gate when he got out. Uh, I've met several of these students at the gate. Um, you go on YouTube and type in Chris Hedges graduation Rutgers. You can see we graduated 27 formerly incarcerated from Rutgers this year. And this is the commencement talk I gave to them and their families. Uh, you know, mass incarceration of the civil rights issue of our age. Uh, one of the reasons I will not vote for Joe Biden is because he was the architect of, along with Bill Clinton, of, you know, half of my students would not be in the prison, but for Clinton and Biden, a uh, huge expansion of the death penalty, which he bragged about, militarization of police. Um, I mean, there are many reasons not to vote for Biden, but I'm just, I can't come out of that prison and cast a ballot for somebody who's done that to people I care about. So there's... Um in the also in the introduction, uh, the part that you wrote, there's a great quote, which I didn't prepare for the show today, but I want to read it to you. It says the most valuable blacks are those in prison. August Wilson once said those who have the warrior spirit who had a sense of being African. They got for their women and children what they needed when all other avenues were closed to them. He added, the greatest spirit of resistance among blacks is found among those in prison. So, yeah. um, is, is that really, so the people, do you, do you, how many of our great leaders, I mean, you know, just the people, if, if they even knew what happened to Fred Hampton would free, but uh, like they got him when he was <laughs> like 20 years old. Uh, how it, is, 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 is the state really anytime there's a real leader, they just immediately imprison them. Is that what is happening? Is that why we haven't had any great leaders since MLK and Martin Luther? Uh, I mean, and uh, and Malcolm X. I mean, what what is going on? Yeah, I mean, look, mass incarceration, militarized police who create reigns of terror and what Malcolm X called these internal qualities. They are forms of social control. This isn't about justice. Ninety four percent of the people in our prison system never get a jury trial. They're coerced. And I use that word intentionally coerced to plea out. Charges are stacked against them, which the police, the prosecutors, the public defenders all know are not true. Uh, and then you barter. Uh, and if you go to trial, the, the, the students that I have in prison who have the longest sentences are the ones who went to trial and almost always the ones who did not commit the crime because they thought if they were innocent, they would be found innocent. In fact, they were used as an example. Uh, given these horrific sentences. Again, let's go back to Clinton and Biden, who, who doubled, tripled, quadrupled uh, the sentences uh, meted out to the poor uh, in these courts. Uh, and in the prison, it, it, immediately, I mean, I'll, I'll, I taught a class called Conquest a couple of years after this class. We read Open Veins of Latin America, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and CLR James's Black Jacobins on the Haitian War of Independence. Uh, the only successful slave revolt in human history, and Haiti's been paying for it ever since. Uh, and I was in uh, at the University of Montana. I'd given them the syllabus, and I said, I won't be here this week because I'm speaking at the University of Montana. Uh, I got a phone call in my hotel room. It said, this is the Special Investigations Division of the Department of Corrections of the state of New Jersey. Are you aware that your students just led a sit-down strike in the prison? 
Uh, and uh, I, I, it was a very emotional moment for me. I knew nothing about it. I was not informed about it. Uh, they actually said, and we think you're behind it. Um, <laughs> so I was interrogated for five hours, and I really didn't know about it. I mean, they're not going to tell me. Uh, but what they did is ser- strip search all the cells, interrogate everybody, uh, threaten to take away their job in the kitchen or their right to take a college course until they found the two leaders, and they found them, uh, and they put them in indefinite solitary confinement. Uh, and that's what they do. Uh, it, you know, the, it's it's all about going, and, and August Wilson is right. The level of discussion that I have in a prison classroom dwarfs anything, and I've taught three times at Princeton or and Columbia and all these other universities, because not only do I teach serious intellectuals who have turned their cells into libraries, but people who understand the criminal justice system, understand white supremacy, understand the violence, the inherent intrinsic violence of the American state. Um, And so you begin discussions in those classrooms at a level that these privileged white kids can't even begin to meet. I I know. Why, Jimmy, why would cops waste time chasing after people who are innocent? Why, I've had people say that to me. <laughs> well, because the quota system, it's not about crime. I, if they want federal dollars, which they all want, for, quote unquote, the war on drugs, um, then it's about a number game. And that's, that's all they do. It's harassment. Uh, and then it's also about because corporations and the wealthy no longer pay taxes, they've got to fill those holes. You take like St. Louis County. This is where uh, uh, Ferguson in Ferguson, Michael Brown was killed. 70, 30 percent of the income came from fines and they just <laughs> yeah. make up fines. My favorite is obstructing pedestrian traffic. This is real. That means standing on a sidewalk. Uh, mowing your lawn, not mowing your lawn. I mean, anything, uh, open containers, loose cigarettes. It's how Eric Garner was choked to death, although he actually that day wasn't even selling loose cigarettes. So it's it's uh, it's social control because these urban uh, wastelands, you know, that have been decimated with the shipment of manufacturing overseas, which are filled mostly with people of color, have to be controlled. And you do it three ways. You uh, unleash police uh, who are allowed, given total impunity, including the ability to use lethal force against unarmed civilians. A thousand people die a year, almost all of them unarmed. Uh, You uh, create a court system that is just a conveyor belt uh, for people into jails and prisons. And then evictions. People forget about evictions roughly every six months. You lock up the men uh, and you evict the women and children. Uh, and so there, there's constant instability, which makes it impossible to have any cohesion or networking within the community. And that's also by design. So when I first started to read that quote by August Wilson, when he said the most valuable blacks are those in prison, I thought he was going to be referring to the fact that, you know, in inner cities, uh, black people are of no use to the corporation. Poor people, poor people. Yeah. And but they are used to them if they're in prison. How so, Jimmy? Well, first, there's slave labor. You can then you can pay them 20 cents an hour to go do work. And also, the government will pay the corporation 40 to 70 thousand dollars here in California, 70 grand a year to lock them up. So they now become valuable to the corporation to the point where when a judge in California ordered Kamala Harris's office to release prisoners because of overcrowding. They argued in court that they couldn't do it because it would upset the prison labor system. So it, it, what do you say? I mean, the, the, the way that we've turned poor people into commodities, it's like it's a new slavery, right? Well, it is a new slavery. That's exactly right. And prisons are plantations. That's what they are. Uh, and in prisons in the South, Alabama, other places, they don't even pay. You don't even get my students get 22 cents an hour, $28 a month for a 40 hour week. Uh, and you have about a, uh, roughly a million people within our prison system working for for-profit corporations, McDonald's uniforms, stuff like this. Uh, and you, you have prisons, California is notorious for this, going to corporations and saying, look, you don't need to abuse sweatshop workers in Bangladesh. We have plenty of sweatshop workers right here behind bars. Uh, and they can't strike, they can't organize, you don't have to pay any benefits, you don't have to pay them if they're sick, and if they're a problem, we'll put them in solitary confinement. Uh, and, and so 
yeah, it is. I mean, for me, prison is a window into the perfect world of the corporate state yes. and what they want to do to the rest of us. Uh, and, you know, Dostoevsky actually wrote about that. He said, if you want to understand a country, go to their prisons. I think it was Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, I can't remember. Um, and that's right. Uh, and you've got to look at, at how they treat people who are powerless to know how they want to treat you. Uh, so I suppose if there's any, you know, dark humor to this, it's, you know, because we've turned our backs on these people uh, and ignored them and, and busied ourselves with kind of boutique activism while people of color were being crucified across this country, um, they started with them, but they're not done with them. They're coming for us now. And and given what's happening because of the coronavirus and the economic meltdown, it's coming a lot sooner than you think. Yes, it's it's being accelerated because of the coronavirus. But so what? What what I've said is that so whatever we do as a country, really a corporation, we're a corporate state. Uh, to other countries, which is invade them under false pretense, say we're going to bring liberty and democracy. What we're really bringing is corporate exploitation and we want to steal their natural resources. And now, uh, so we create this uh, amazing crisis in another country with our military invasion, which is terrorism. And then we use that crisis to steal their natural resources and re... re and reconfigure their culture and po and body politic in a way that serves us. And my friend David Feldman would always say, whatever we do to people overseas, we're going to do it to ourselves. And I didn't know what he meant until I just saw this uh, stimulus bill happen during this coronavirus. So what's happening right now is the instead of using our military, because they don't have to use our military, they already have our government. The corporate state already has our, our government. So what they've done is use, they didn't have to install a puppet state through military means. They already have it installed. So they use it against us. And right now, uh, the corporate fleecing of this country is unparalleled what's happening. Instead of, instead of first of all, in the middle of a pandemic, coming up with a health care plan to ha give people health care in the pandemic, they didn't think about it. They immediately gave $5 trillion to the richest people in the country and left everyone else scrambling. And now Nancy Pelosi's on TV doing little cute segments about how much ice cream she's eating during the pandemic. That's really happening. And, and Hillary Clinton says we need to open up the markets... <laughs> the ACA market, so we can sell people health care as they lose their jobs. So that's worse than saying let them eat cake. That's saying let's sell them some cake. That's where the Democratic Party is, and I'm supposed to vote for Joe Biden. My theory is Joe Biden is the greater evil uh, than Donald Trump because when people elected Barack Obama, they went to sleep. They thought, well, he's in charge. He, he kicked five million people out of their house in a crisis just like this. He doesn't help people. He does what the corporate state wants. So can um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but let me just end by saying, are, aren't you still shocked that people like Chomsky can say you have to vote for Joe Biden because he's somehow some... I say he is not the lesser of two evil. If 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 John McCain would have won that election in 2008, we'd be better off right now because nobody would have let him kick five million people out of their house while he made the banks bigger, took us from two wars to seven, opened the Arctic to drilling, all the stuff Barack Obama did. People would have screamed about it. But because Barack Obama did it uh, instead of John McCain, it, it, everybody was OK with it, just like Bill Clinton was not the lesser of two evil. So can you speak to this kind of ridiculous uh, idea in our culture that even Chomsky repeats every four years that voting for the lesser of two evils somehow gets you somewhere. Right. Well, this has been Chom I love Chomsky. He's you know I would argue he's our most important intellectual, and I've learned a tremendous amount from him. Uh, but Noam has done this for a really long time. He also doesn't support BDS. And I did an event with him about a year or two ago in San Francisco. And even though uh, I like him very much, it was pretty contentious. So there are certain issues that he has. I mean, and probably issues that I have that. He doesn't agree. I just don't I, I don't think historically it, it's proven that it works very well. Um, and let's be clear about the least worst, uh, because when Bernie was surging, there were all these articles in The New York Times uh, quoting Lloyd Blankfein, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs and all these other rich Democratic donors saying, you know, if Bernie or Warren, mostly Bernie is the nominee, we're all going to vote for Trump. Yes. So least worst only works for for us, not for them. Uh, and they know they're safe with Biden. Uh, look, it, it's the fact it's all of these 
all of these programs of austerity, the, uh, the, the evisceration of our constitutional rights and civil liberties, the right to privacy, uh, the complete control of the legislative process by corporate lobbyists and corporate money, uh, the, the massive amounts of money it takes to run, which comes from the oligarchs, which is only a form of legalized bribery. I mean, this all came through the least worse, the Democratic Party, uh, the figures like Clinton, who were going to have fundraising parity with the Republicans and serve corporate power, which is what happened. And Biden was a stalwart of this uh, by essentially not only abandoning uh, working men and women, but but making war on the vulnerable. Uh, it all came from them. And that's how we ended up with Trump. Trump is the is the symptom. He's not he, he's not the disease. Uh, and I have covered collapsing society. I spent 20 years overseas and Central America, Rios Mont. I was lived in Argentina under the junta. I uh, was in the former Yugoslavia for the war. When systems seize up, when power is is taken by a cabal, when it no longer works, when everything within that society, you know, even if it has the veneer of democracy, is used to funnel wealth and power upwards into the hands of this totally unaccountable, rapacious, oligarchic elite. Uh, then eventually people revolt against the system itself. And the problem is the system. Uh, and if anybody thinks Joe Biden is going to make things better, I suppose maybe temporarily it's a it's a little better in, in that he's not as vulgar. And right. I mean, I don't know, maybe he'll fall into complete dementia. Uh, and and they'll just try. I mean, right now the whole camp Biden campaign seems, you know, let's hide him and make him speak as little as possible. Um, but it's the it's the system of corporate power, what Sheldon Wollen calls inverted totalitarianism, and that is not going to get better uh, unless we make war against the system. Uh, and 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 that just you know this whole idea that voting makes any real difference, as Emma Goldman said, if voting was that effective, it would be illegal. Uh, Biden, the, uh, the oligarchs want Biden just like they wanted Clinton uh, because he's a more palatable face. Let me just go back, Jimmy, to what you said about empire because it's important, having spent 20 years on the outer reaches of empire. What empire is, is the external expression of white supremacy. Um, my closest friend who just died, James Cone, the father of black liberation theology, grew up in segregated Arkansas. We had completely different lives, but I think we connected on that understanding how venal and, and how evil white supremacy is, because I was in countries in Central America, in the Middle East for seven years, where I saw how uh, the empire uh, used the most brutal forms of control and violence, uh, and, and, and which was uh, an overt kind of racist disdain for the cheap labor that they were subjugating and the natural resources that they were plundering. Uh, and you talked about how you know, what happens in empire comes home. Thucydides wrote that about the evil of the Athenian empire. He said the tyranny that Athens imposed on others, it finally imposed on itself. And that's exactly what's happening to us because they, they test the techniques, the drones, the wholesale surveillance, the militarized police. Uh, they test it out on what Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth. Uh, and they hollow the country out from the inside. I mean, our military is, is the, 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 the American military is uh, the most, uh, the, or the institution most responsible for the death of American democracy, what democracy we had, and it was always very flawed and largely for white people. But, uh, but that, and, and as they've hollowed the country out and it's just become one uh, center of, you know, impoverished urban decay after another, they've brought back all of the mechanisms of control they use overseas and empire to Im be imposed on us. That's what's happening. That is. Um, so you talk about the corporate coup d'etat that it's happening in slow motion. I think it's happening in fast motion right now. And can you talk to people a little bit about what you mean when you use the term corporate coup d'etat? So that's John Ralston Saul's term. Uh, he wrote a very good book, Voltaire's Bastards, uh, which I would recommend. Um, and it, it, I think you're right that that it, it, first of all, it's over. I mean, anybody who thinks that we live in a functioning democracy should turn off Rachel Maddow and and Jesus and start Christ. start reading Sheldon Wollen. Um, so uh, it, it you're and you're right that the mechanisms to essentially halt uh, any kind of 
uh, uh, descent into a, a, a very overt police state are, are now gone. Uh, and, and, and what will happen is that the, um, it, there will be unrest. I think it's inevitable. I don't know what it will look like. I don't know what form it will take, uh, but it's coming. Uh, and all you have to do is look at our internal colonies to see how both the physical mechanisms of militarized policing without accountability terror. I mean, let's be clear, that's terror, uh, coupled with a court system uh, that doesn't function, coupled with a rewriting of laws, uh, what Hannah Arendt calls, you know, the uh, creating a society where rights become privileges, uh, which means they can be taken away. What's been done to poor people of color in these uh, urban pockets will now be done to the rest of us. The tools of subjugation will be used on the rest of us. Uh, and there is no effort to respond rationally to what's ahead of us. I mean, they know that we are headed for an economic dislocation that will rival uh, the depression that we underwent in the 1930s. Uh, some of them, not Trump, but there have to be some people who are astute enough to realize that there are mechanisms, Roosevelt employed many of them, by which you can mitigate this suffering, And but they're not going to go that route this time. This time, they're going to bring out uh, you know, their version of the brown shirts, which will include these uh, paramilitary, for-profit, mercenary uh, entities uh, organized by these Christian fascists like Eric Prince, the brother of Betsy DeVos. And of course, there was just a story a couple weeks ago about how he's using these mercenaries to infiltrate teachers' unions and everything else. That's what's coming. They're, they're ready. It's, it, the, the, the infrastructure is there. Uh, the legal system is decayed to such an extent that there's no impediment. We don't have any form of power left. Our unions have been broken. Uh, we're all sitting uh, entranced in front of electronic hallucinations. Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't look good. So just one more uh, thing about Joe Biden and the ridiculous idea that somehow voting for him is will help anything. Uh, they used to when I said I wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton, I got pilloried by the again, the m news media on the left say, calling me a petulant child it's called a petulant child on air uh, on the Young Turks because I wouldn't vote for a warmongering corporatist like Hillary Clinton because I would then be complicit in the crime she committed. And uh, and the reason they used it was all oh, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court. And what, in the middle of Barack Obama n not m making sure his appointment got sat, which he could have did, he didn't. He wanted to use that issue so they could hold that over my head when I voted. They did use it. It didn't work. I still voted third party. But Joe, now that that doesn't really work anymore, the Supreme Court, because Joe Biden was instrumental in Clarence Thomas being on the Supreme Court and Antonin Scalia. So <laughs> that now I'm supposed to vote for Joe Biden and hope he does better than Clarence Thomas. I mean, what do you say to the, that argument? Well, it's it's a ridiculous argument, um, you know, as, as everything comes down to a Supreme Court nomination uh, and all of the structural uh, systems that have created tremendous amounts of uh, oppression, uh, you know, for the rest of us, and and funneled money towards this military machine, the programs of austerity, uh, you know, all of this was a bipartisan effort. I mean, in fact, there's on on all of these major issues, whether it's wholesale surveillance or austerity or prisons or anything else, there's all, no difference, virtually no difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, yes, the Democrats are more tolerant and, and, you know, and, and are willing to put the face of a woman or, uh, you know, an African American, uh, on, you know, as, as a kind of branding of empire. Uh, but the, it, again, it's, it's this personalization of politics, which is so infantile, uh, and everything we debate is really anti-politics because we don't talk about anything of substance. And, and that comes down to issues of, uh, how your economy is structured, class, everything else. Those, we never have those discussions. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, voting is, is a, a, you know, such a minor part of what it means to be civically engaged anyway. It's about holding power accountable. It's about pitting power against power. History has borne that out. Uh, I lived in France and 
you know, when, you know, and I lived there under Sarkozy. And when Sarkozy tried to, he was awful, and Macron is even worse. But, you know, when he tried to do something, you know, next thing you know, Paris was filled with farmers on tractors blocking all the roads. Uh, I, my, you, I, my son did his graduate work in Paris. I said, when you go over there, ask your students uh, what, would, what they would do if suddenly they started charging them sixty or $70,000 a year to go to college. Well, they'd shut the damn country down. Uh, and that's how we got to begin to think. Uh, and we shouldn't be having these discussions about elections. I'm very strong supporter of Extinction Rebellion. They've got it right. Of course, not, I'm going to get into the whole nonviolence issue, but it's got to be nonviolent. Um, and we begin. We have to begin to create sustained mobilizations that that muck the system up so it can't work. That's our only hope. So, you know, America was founded on a violent revolution. I just re I just saw a documentary about the Cuban Revolution. It was amazing all the violence they used, and it worked. Why? Um, but then you see people. You know, then you see Gandhi, Martin Luther King. What? Uh, why did violent revolution fall out of such favor? <laughs> because the the state uses violence all the time. Well, that's what the state, that's what a state is. A state seeks to uh, corner the monopoly on violence and all other violence is illegitimate. Revolutions are actually nonviolent events. Um, I'm half, now that I'm sequestered, I'm halfway through Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution. Uh, they are, it's, it's only, as all the theorists of revolution have pointed out, it's only when significant sectors of the apparatus that keeps the ruling elites in power that defect. Uh, so they'll no longer defend the regime. And I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe and so witnessed it. Then that system can't sustain itself. So in September of 1989, I was in East Germany. Uh, Eric Honecker, the dictator, sends down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig, which is, was the center of the protests. They get there. The local communist parties refuse to deploy it. Honecker's out of power within a week. The Cuban revolution, the, I mean, Che and, and Fidel uh, you know, popularized this whole FOCO theory of an armed. But in fact, that's not what happened. When you look at what brought down Batista and the Cuban regime were general strikes. Uh, so violence is often a part of revolution. I mean, even in the Russian Revolution, it was when the Cossacks defected. It was a great uh, scene, and uh, you know, the Cossacks actually started firing on the police who remained loyal to the Tsar. Uh, but it's when the Cossacks defected that it was over. Um, and so that's revolutions are different. I mean, I've covered lots of conflicts. I covered the civil wars in El Salvador and, and Guatemala. I covered the first Gulf War, which was largely mechanized units in the desert. I've covered foreign occupations like Gaza. They're different categories. And during foreign occupations, you go back and look at Algeria, Vietnam, uh, you know, force does work to drive the occupier out. Um, a, but in a revolution, uh, a revolution is different. It's about uh, essentially diminishing the power of a discredited elite uh, until those around them won't protect them anymore. So the Shah flees Iran and the head of the armed forces said, I will no longer defend the regime. It's over. That's how it works. Uh, and it's interesting. Read Lenin. I mean, Lenin, we'll, we won't have a discussion on Lenin, but uh, Lenin certainly understood the mechanics of revolution, which is why he was so opposed to anarchist violence, even though his own brother was uh, executed for an uh, assassination plot against the czar. So uh, you think, why is it that in France they would, ch what is wrong with our culture in the United States that the only thing, people are, people are protesting right now, but they're not protesting for health care or a UBI or for the government to give them economic relief like they gave to corporations. They're, they're actually protesting so they could go out and make money for the corporations. It's crazy. Well, what is wrong with our culture that we lost our sense of, of a protest? Well, it was, you go all the way back, to, again, to bring up Wilson, uh, there was a, such a vicious assault. I mean, America had a very radical uh, socialist, and we've written a communist movement written out, erased from our history. Uh, you know, in Chicago in the 1930s, when they came to evict you, uh, you know, when the police showed up to haul all the furniture out of the apartment, everybody said, go get the Reds, go get the Reds. Well, they may not have been communists, but they knew that all the communist stalwarts would come and move the damn furniture back in the apartment and 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 block the police from throwing the people out. And, and the war against not only our left, 
uh, but even our liberal class. So you 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 create this distortion of the Cold War liberal or the Clinton-esque type liberal, which is kind of that figures who speak in that feel your pain language, but serve corporate uh, and police power. Uh, you know, in France, there still is a communist party. In France, and as in Italy, I was once invited by the communist party to speak to all the graduating high school students in uh, Florence, 10,000 of them, uh, for which on the way back, I was uh, held for a couple hours, even though I had a valid US passport by Homeland Security and not allowed into the United States. I don't know whether they were going to send me back to Italy or what. Uh, but uh, our left was eviscerated and destroyed uh, so that we don't even have the vocabulary uh, to speak about class warfare, which is precisely what's happening now. Uh, our media systems have been so utterly degraded. And I also have to uh, pinpoint, and I did this in my book, Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle, that we've severed ourselves from print. Uh, and you're never really going to understand systems of power by looking at a screen. Uh, you do have to sit down and read political theory. You have to read, look, I mean, I admit Marx is a slog. Uh, and I'm not a Marxist in that I you know, don't believe in the withering away of the state and all this kind of stuff. But his, his critique of capitalism is unmatched uh, uh, with a heavy infusion of Frederick Engels' data. Um, and the first capital, the first uh, volume of Capital gets it. Um, and, you know, they work quite hard. I, this is one of the reasons I teach in a prison, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the systems, if, if you can't, if you don't have the language to describe systems of power, you can't confront them. Uh, and it's only our elites, uh, and I went to these elite schools, where you can get that kind of educator. And of course, what you're doing at places like Harvard is being groomed for the plutocracy. It's why places like Harvard exist. Uh, uh, but if you're, uh, let's go back to August Wilson, a real warrior, uh, if you stand fast with the what James Cone called the crucified of the earth, uh, if you know who you are and who you represent, then they're damned if you're going to get an education that will allow you to understand how the system functions. I mean, people say, for instance, the prison system doesn't work. And as you pointed out, uh, these bodies are worth nothing to the corporate state on the streets of Newark or Cleveland or Detroit or anywhere else. But once you lock them in a cage, they generate $60,000 a year. And I say, no, you don't understand. The system works exactly the way it's designed to work. And we have to begin to understand the, the nature of power that is arrayed against us and how vicious and venal, and I would, it would bring up the climate crisis, even evil that it is, because this system is quite willing to sacrifice us and all future generations for their short-term profit. Uh, and so... Uh, I, I think it's all of those things, a, de a degradation of the media landscape, and I, it co covers the, I've covered, I've watched it over my whole career. It began uh, as a reporter in the 1980s in Central America, uh, the rise of illiteracy, the f sophisticated forms of control, uh, the way politics has just become another version of ESPN. Uh, you know, with the numbers and the stats and the horse race and, and these manufactured personalities, they're all manufactured personalities, Biden, Trump, Bernie, all of them, they're manufactured, they're not real. Uh, and that personalization of politics has kind of dumbed down the country. And, and of course, that's, that's why slaveholders didn't want enslaved people to read. Uh, in fact, they could be killed for it. Uh, and and the, it's, it's, the, the point is to keep us unaware the point is to keep us ignorant, uh, and and for those people who refuse, who 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 uh, name systems of power and attempt to confront them, then they have the 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 iron the iron heel of the boot, uh, and they use it. and And those are the people I teach in prison. Now, you're an ordained minister, correct? I am. So now, where in the hell has the Christian left been? For the last 40, 50 years, where, where there are, they, they are invisible. What is going on? I mean, if go ahead, I'll leave it. Well, to that. they left the urban enclaves with white flight. They engaged in the same kind of boutique activism. And how is it with me? Spirituality, which is just narcissism. Uh, they uh, ignored uh, economic justice, which is King and Malcolm and everybody else understood was fundamental to confronting racism. 
Uh, and they continued to speak in, again, like the liberal class, in that rhetoric of justice and fairness and tolerance, a word, by the way, Martin Luther King never used, uh, and, uh, but never, never do anything. Uh, I mean, this is why I don't like liberals, because uh, they, I, and I learned my lesson. I, I lived in a housing project in Roxbury, uh, and ran a church there while I was in seminary at Harvard Divinity School, uh, and I would commute into Cambridge with all of these classmates of mine who talked about empowering people they never met. Uh, and so this is the this is what Chomsky has delineated. This is the role of the liberal establishment. Uh, and so where are they? Um, you know, they're they're where the rest of the liberal society is checked out. Uh, you know, refusing to confront the monolithic forms of evil, even death, that lie before us, if we talk about climate change, uh, and, and busying themselves with, uh, you know, diversity and identity politics, inclusiveness, I'm not, all of this is good, uh, but to somehow draw a line there as if Clarence Thomas, because he's a black man, is an asset on the Supreme Court. Uh, it's all cosmetic. I mean, as Cornel West said very correctly about Barack Obama, he was just a black mascot for Wall Street. Uh, and so uh, the church has been, uh, you know, destroyed by the same kind of, uh, you know, liberal irrelevance that has infected the rest of the liberal society. So uh, I, went, I was really enamored of Tulsi Gabbard's campaign because she seemed to be doing the critique that no other Democrat was willing to do of the not only of our interventionist wars, but of the Democratic Party and the security state and the intelligence community and how it worked. And then, of course, at the end, she decided to throw, you know, but so uh, which was just a crushing blow to me personally. But what did you make of that? Like, I don't understand how. It, am I just being naive that she was I thought she was making a real critique and she was doing and she was certainly ostracized from every even her own party. So can you make sense of that campaign at all or does it matter? Well, I mean, she paid for it. I mean, they remember they called her a Russian asset. Yes. Was that Clinton? Clinton who yes. said that? Hillary Clinton. Yes. Okay, there you go. Um, uh, so she did pay for it. I mean, these people play hardball. They're, I, I know as a reporter for the New York Times, which means you're just kind of on the inside. Um, and behind that curtain, um, the knives are out and they'll stop at nothing. Uh, and, uh, th that's what frightened Bernie Sanders. Uh, that's what frightened Dianne Feinstein when she tried to investigate the torture program by the CIA. Remember, she came out absolutely, there's a stunning press conference where she's just, her face is as white as a ghost. And, uh, she realized that, you know, and the deep state is real, uh, that she just, uh, picked, picked out an enemy who would stop at nothing to destroy her. So, uh, you know, these centers of power uh, are, are very unforgiving, and they will destroy you personally, politically, economically. They will stop at nothing. Uh, and very, very few people have the moral fortitude, you, you know what Niebuhr calls sublime madness, to just keep going. Ralph Nader is one. Ralph's a close friend of mine. I talk to him almost every week. I worked as a speechwriter during his last presidential campaign, and Ralph just wouldn't bend. Uh, and And he's paid for it. But I think we will look back on you know, this particular period in American history, if there's any of us to look back on it and recognize that he's one of the most important and courageous uh, figures in American political life. Julian Assange, right? So you're a Pulitzer Prize winning ju journalist. Wow. I'm still stunned at the lack of yeah. At the situation and the lack of outrage by the American press as they rally around a hack and a clown like Jim Acosta when someone's actually being persecuted for publishing actual secrets that damage the state uh, that, that they're ignoring it and pretending like he is actually a traitor, but he's from another country. So could you talk about the cowardice of American journalism and pol politicians around Julian Assange? So this gets to the whole what Trump, when Chomsky writes about the liberal class. So what happened? Julian uh, publishes uh, through the courage of Chelsea Manning uh, examples of egregious war crimes uh, committed by American forces, primarily in Iraq, but also Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, 
the American press, the New York Times, my old employer, The Guardian, Der Spiegel, they all publish it. Uh, and somehow people have misinterpreted this as an act of courage. It isn't. Uh, they were uh, astute enough to realize that if they didn't publish it, uh, the alternative publications would publish it. Uh, and it essentially shamed them into doing their journalism. Uh, we go back to Bob Shear, uh, who uh, was the editor in chief at Truthdig before he and all the rest of us were pushed out. Bob was at Ramparts. So Ramparts was COINTEL Pro. Ramparts. Uh, they published uh, Soul on Ice. They uh, published the first reports about the Vietnam War and what was actually happening, including the iconic photo of the young girl running naked down a road burning with napalm, which King saw and, and prompted King to denounce the war on April 4th, 1967 at Riverside Church. So it's always been the role of the alternative press, which is not constrained by, uh, you know, commercialism to speak truth, to shame the traditional press into doing their job. Uh, and that's what happened. That's why the New York Times, for instance, ran. But they hated Julian and Assange and WikiLeaks from the start. And so they published the information and almost immediately they flipped uh, into doing the state's bidding and destroying Julian. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the whole Swedish thing except to say it was bullshit. Um, and I looked very closely at it, as does did Niels Melzer and several others, the rapporteur on torture who visited Julian and Belmarsh and said this guy is under psychological torture. And then, of course, Julian's sin was that uh, he went after all of the power elite with the Podesta emails, uh, exposing Hillary Clinton's acceptance of $675,000 for three speeches to Goldman Sachs, a sum that can only be described as a bribe. Uh, the fact that the Clinton campaign was actively working to make Trump the Republican nominee because they thought she could walk all over him, uh, the fact that she was saying one thing to Wall Street and quite another thing to, uh, you know, as a candidate. Uh, and people will say, well, you know, they should have exposed it after the campaign. And I say, you know, well, I suppose you could argue that. Uh, but what you're really saying is the American public doesn't have a right to know. That's right. Uh, and, and if you do argue that, you better not call yourself a journalist. Uh, and Julian, who's a friend, I visited him several times in the embassy when he was in Ecuador. I have tremendous admiration for him, as I do with Chelsea Manning, as I do for Edward Snowden, as I do for Kiriakou, Bill Binney, all these people who have risked their career and, in Julian's case, his life, uh, to stand up and speak the truth about empire. Uh, and uh, the liberal class does what the liberal class is designed to do. Let's go again back to Chomsky. Uh, it posits itself as the moral arbiter of the society. Uh, and it is permitted that role within a capitalist democracy because when it will never question the motives and the intentions of the ruling elites. But when you actually do begin to question the motives and intentions of the ruling elites, when you begin to expose them for who they are, then you use the liberal class, which is what's happened with Julian, to turn them into discredited pariahs, which they've also done, by the way, with Ralph. Uh, and so that's why you traditionally allow liberal, you know, a liberal institution to exist. It, it can ameliorate the system. It can address some of the more uh, egregious excesses of the system, uh, but it fundamentally uh, buttresses and defends the system itself. I was a victim of this when I was denouncing, and I'd been the Middle East bureau chief uh, for the New York Times, denouncing Bush's call to invade Iraq. On the day of the invasion, I was giving 15 minutes or 12 minutes, I can't remember, on fresh air, talking about why this invasion, and I am an Arabic speaker, I spent seven years in the Middle East, months of my life in Iraq, why it was going to be the fiasco that it was, not to mention the fact that preemptive war is, uh, is under international law a, a, a war crime. It's a criminal war of aggression. And then followed me was Michael Ignatiev, who was a friend, uh, uh, and uh, arguing, you know, with a heavy heart and telling us that he'd oppose the war in Vietnam, but we had to go in there and liberate the people of uh, Iraq and save the women of Afghanistan as if uh, the, you know, 100 and 101st Airborne is somehow going to save the women of Afghanistan. Uh, and that's, and that's, you know, that is the traditional role of the liberal class. So I got into this journalism thing or the news thing sideways, right? I came from comedy. I did a political, I was always interested in politics. I did a, a political a comedy central special and that got the attention of the young Turks. And so they called me in to do commentary. And then I started, 
and that got me on the public radio station here in California, and and now I'm, and now it's nationwide. And so my whole thing is, um, is I you know I keep I I just am gobsmacked on a daily basis at how bad journalism is. Not just bad, but it's worse than even what Chomsky said in manufacturing consent. But at its very best, that's what it is. Manufacturing. If you look at RussiaGate now, again, you know I'm just a nightclub comedian who's entertained drunks for 30 years, and I start doing a YouTube news show, and I see through RussiaGate with within about a half a second, I could see how ridiculous this was, and how there was absolutely no evidence to support anything they were saying. But the entire U.S. media, with the exception of maybe five people, repeated this unbelievable evidence-free conspiracy theory while they wagged their finger at people like Alex Jones. And so I consequently have Aaron Matei on, who won an award for his debunking of the Russiagate narrative in the nation. So tip of the hat to Katrina Vandenhovel, who took a lot of heat for publishing him in the nation, doing the right thing. But he's still a pariah. And uh, he, although he won an award for it, and whenever I had him on, I always like, how can you... I, I don't even want to be friends with these people. I think that's what allows me to do what I do is because everybody in journalism, that's their world. So no matter how much they're a truth teller, they still need the affirmation of their peers and they still need to be in that career. I come from comedy and every person I ever respected in comedy has patted me on the head. So I got that fix. I don't need Chris Hayes or Rachel Maddow to tell me I'm doing a good job because I don't give a fuck what they think. I care what Brian Regan thinks, right? I care what, what Patton Oswalt thinks, Bill Burr thinks, people who are my Norm MacDonald, my comedic heroes. That's, they've all did it for me. So even if you're a journalist, it's like it's a part of human psychology. You still want to be on the in crowd, which is why 99.9% .9 of journalists my personal opinion are worthless because uh, they'll never go against the herd mentality like was just revealed in Russiagate. So when push comes to shove, you can never count on journalism in America. That's how I feel. And I know that's your profession and you're an award winner. So if, I, if comedy was as bad as journalism, I would feel horrible. How do you feel? Yeah, it's sad. Uh, I mean, it's careerism. So let's take the first Gulf War. Uh, anybody who reported with me out of the Middle East didn't have any difference in terms of my assessment and certainly my outspokenness on behalf of the Palestinians. They just recognize that it's not good for their career. Uh, and I think that's what drives a lot of it. People read that, that you know, they read the zeitgeist. They understand that uh, clobbering the Democratic Party for their complicity in the reconfiguration of American society into an oligarchy and the betrayal of the working class uh, is not good for their career. Uh, so let's go after Putin and Russia. Uh, and by the way, I'm not saying Russia didn't interfere in the election. They probably did. I've, every election I've covered overseas, we interfered with. Uh, we gave Boris Yeltsin $1.5 uh, uh, billion in order to be reelected in 96, I believe. So, uh, but it didn't, that's not why Trump is elected. Uh, and so if you go after the uh, the, the centers of power, the democratic centers of power, um, then you're going to be pushed out. You know, Matt Taibbi wrote a good book. It's called Hate Inc., uh, which you should get right, um, because right. it kind of updates Chomsky because a lot of things have changed with a 24-hour news cycle. Uh, and uh, because in the old system, it was, you know, Tom Brokoff or Walter Cronkite, and it was kind of you know, this trusted father figure middle of the road objectivity that all broke down with cable i mean it's faux it's a fake it's fake it's not real but and now it's it's really uh kind of orwell's uh was it three minutes of hate uh so you know we hate them they hate us that's what sells now uh, and so on tidy's book on one half of the cover is sean hannity on the other is rachel maddow because they do exactly the same thing they do and that's and you know for those of us who actually come out of journalism uh, it's completely apparent, but you're right. It, it's burlesque. Uh, it's it's show business. It's vaudeville. It's uh, but it's not journalism. Um, these people couldn't report a story if you put a gun to their head. Uh, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. Well, listen, we've had, it's 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 shocking that uh, 
I can, on a daily basis, uh, outreport CNN and the Washington Post when it comes to Syria, Libya, Iran, Venezuela, uh, Brazil. It's just amazing. Like, I just know what they're going to say is a lie. It's wrong. So it's uh, so, you know, my theory, I remember I was on a panel with Cenk Uger and he we were talking about how, how do you believe that? What do you believe from the government? What do you not believe? How do you? And I said, well, I just my jumping off point is the government is lying and I just have to find out where. Yeah, well, that's right. Power power lies. I mean, all governments lies, I have Stone said. And, uh, you know, that was when I did journalism, because I wasn't in Washington, I wasn't doing lunch. I was in Sarajevo, or I was in El Salvador, I was in Gaza. My job was to show how they lied. And uh, it meant that I was not only at war with my own government, but at war with the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. Uh, and so balance at the paper became, you know, my reporting from Gaza next to a column of probably exactly the same length, uh, w given exactly the same display with a lie. Uh, so people could believe what they wanted to believe. Yes. Um, but uh, you're right. That's that's and that's what Julian Assange, why he's such a heroic figure and why I admire him so much. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I, I think, it, the, you know, from following these court proceedings, it's fixed. I think he's going to be lynched uh, under the Espionage Act, even though he's not an American citizen. WikiLeaks is not a U.S. based publication. Uh, and that is the end, because. Uh, there is actually under the Espionage Act, it does, which is a foreign, our equivalent of our British Foreign Secrets Act. It is a crime uh, to possess classified information, uh, but all of us in journalism, I, my, myself included, have published classified information. But once you create that legal precedent uh, by sending Julian to prison, his sentence is potentially 175 years, um, then it's over. Uh, then there is no way to shine a lens into the inner workings of power. That's where we're headed. And so, I mean, as a profession, it's just a garbage profession because no, nobody's saying that they're, they're dismantling your profession and you're all looking the other way for a paycheck. You're not what I, I mean. I had Aaron Matei on and he said, well, Jimmy, uh, people aren't in the position like you. They have the bills to pay and they have a family. And they did. It's like you're talking about fucking journalism. You're talking about the holy thing is they have to tell the truth. That's all journalism is, is stick your head down the street, see what's happening, and fucking report back. And they can't do that because they have bills to pay. Then fucking get another job, right? Yeah, I mean, why do it? I mean, <laughs> I don't see the point. Yeah, just go sell cars or whatever the fuck it is you want to do. You should be honest. <laughs> I don't know. Right. I don't get it, man. I don't get it. But listen, Chris, you've been very generous with your time and... Uh, are they going to put that? I would love to see that play. Of course, now nobody's doing anything, but the play Caged. Uh, it was it, you, you. You put it up once, and it sold out, right? And did really well. How was it received? Every night it was sold out. And what was most moving is that we had a night just for the families of the playwrights. Um, and about three or four minutes into the play, I heard somebody sniffling, and they the, they cried for ninety minutes. Yeah, it was really powerful. Yeah, just reading some of it was, you know, I don't know. It's too much for me, actually. It's just just like your last book. It's just it's so descriptive of the, you know, the despair uh, and the personal agony and loneliness that uh, it's just it's I can't tag you. Know, I'm low. I'm weak. So uh, I can't. It's tough. It's really tough. It's a heart wrencher. But uh, wow, I'd love to see it. So is there any plans to, to, to take it on the road or for that play to be seen anywhere else? I mean, hopefully someone else. I, the, the, there's a some a director in New York who's thinking about it. Hopefully somebody will pick it up. Yeah, okay. or at least in schools. You know, I mean, put it on in schools. It's right. their voice. You don't hear their voices. People write about prisons, but this is their voice. Yeah, yeah, which is was really powerful. It was, it was, yeah. yeah you know, it, it's interesting to. You know, that there's people in prisons and that they're turning their cells into libraries and they're quoting, they're out in the, out in the yard and they're quoting Plato to each other. And, you know, it's just, wow, that, that's the, I'd like to see a play written by those guys, certainly, not by some guy who grew up in a fucking cul-de-sac, I'll tell you that. It's when, it's when the Bard, uh, the, when the in, Bard has an in-prison program mm -hmm. and when the, the, that Bard uh, in-prison college program debating team debated Harvard and won. You know, it was big news all around the world. It wasn't news to me. I wasn't surprised at all. Ah, 
Uh, I went to Harvard, so maybe that's why I wasn't surprised. <laughs> hey, what do you th- speaking of? <laughs> she, speaking of that, did you go to journalism school? Never, never took a journalism course in life. So what I say on this show is there's two kinds of people who go to journalism schools, suckers and shitty journalists. Am I right about that? You know, I would say, I would say definitely an undergraduate major in journalism is a complete waste. Um, I, you know, I went to El Salvador as a freelance reporter and I learned journalism from all these old uh, reporters who'd cover Vietnam, which is why I'm still alive because I listened to them. Uh, and you know, they would edit my copy and look, so it was a kind of de facto journalism school, journalism school, one year degree. Now Columbia for some reason, I don't know why is two, but you know, you, you, you know, taking a couple good writing courses, but it's a trade. And, uh, I think you're, I mean, I spent eight years in university without ever getting a doctorate. Uh, which took work. Um, but, you know, I studied theology, English literature, philosophy, classics. And uh, I think that that gave me uh, a kind of, you know, a, a, a rich uh, grounding in the in the humanities and liberal arts and history uh, that inf- made me a better journalist. I think that's far more important uh, because y- you can uh, you know, journalism is not a profession. It, it is it is a trade. Uh, we work with words the same way. I mean, it's the difference between, a, a, I mean, it's when you do it well, it, it takes a great deal of skill. It's it's like a master carpenter. We can all go out in our garage with a couple boards, but a ma- to be a master carpenter takes years and years of work. Uh, but yeah, I do. I, I'm not a big, f- I've actually taught journalism, but I'm not a big fan of journalism school either. I took one journalism class in college, and uh, the first assignment was we had to write our own obituary, (laughs) 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 which was very useful. I I found it very useful. I just want to, before I let you go, my brother, uh, who's a personal uh, injury lawyer, he, uh, he texted me about our conversation about the prisoners. And what he says is, what isn't said is that the goodness of humanity inside of those men existed inside of them before they were imprisoned. And the failure of our society is that its system is its system that is unable to tap that. Rather, it locks them away. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. You know, they're in the play, at one point I asked them to write about, you know, a scene where they're their uh, their mother and one of the students at the end of the class said, well what if we're a product of rape and i said well that's timmy what you got to write he comes back the next week it's completely autobiographical and he and his half brother in a car they're stopped by the police they find a weapon if nobody claims the weapon they're all charged with weapons possession it wasn't his gun and he tells the police it's his and then he relates the phone call from the county to his mother that says it doesn't matter ma uh, you have the son you love. That's why he's in prison. Uh, yeah, I and read I, that. That, that. Go ahead. I have so many stories like that. I mean, these are some of the most remarkable human beings I have ever met who have risen above uh, adversity and oppression and racism, endured things that none of us can imagine, and come out men and women of such amazing integrity and brilliance. Look at that YouTube video of the graduation. Just type Chris Hedges, Rutgers graduation. Um, They, you know, I'm truly inspired by them and privileged uh, to be among them. I get far more from them than I give. Um, They are the most remarkable people I've ever met. And how they came out on the other end to be who they are is nothing short of miraculous. And that they're behind bars is one of the greatest crimes this country engages do you think, I mean, we went through eight years of Barack Obama, a black guy with a Muslim name, as president and chief of our criminal justice system. He imprisoned zero bankers, um, wouldn't take marijuana uh, to a sketch. What, what, is there any hope? I mean, we're the world's largest penal system uh, in the world. Go ahead. What, what do you say to that? Yeah, I don't, I don't share the mania for hope. Um, we just have to do what's right. And hope's a funny thing, especially when you when you build real relationships with oppressed people. And I speak as a white, privileged male, and, and I understand that privilege is a form of a blindness. As hard as I try, that privilege means that I can never fully understand 
who these people are and what they endure. But if I honor that blindness, I can have relationships. I After that class, I, I taught uh, where the students had the sit-down strike. I had one A+. Plus. It was a student who was uh, living in an abandoned house at the age of 14, picked up for a crime he didn't commit. He was barely literate, forced to sign a confession he couldn't read, uh, is sentenced as a child, as a young uh, teenager, as an adult. He's not eligible to go before a parole board until he's 70. Uh, and he, at the end of the class, he says, you know, I know I'm going to die in this prison, but I work as hard as I do because one day I'm going to be a teacher like you. And he walks out. That's hope. You know, maybe in the end we only change the world one person at a time. Um, and I know it doesn't change the system itself, um, but it, it sustains you when you can connect. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think we're finished. Um, but uh, it's now, as so many of my students in prison understand, it's about dignity. It's about independence. It's about justice. Uh, you know, it, it's about the understanding that we will stand with the oppressed and the crucified of the earth no matter what. Um, and as you said correctly, when you, when you truly stand with the oppressed, then you can expect to get treated like the oppressed. And finally, it really comes down to what, is, what constitutes a life of meaning. Um, and, uh, and everything I've fought for my entire life is worse than when I began. But I don't think that invalidates what I've done. So Ted Alexandru was on our show recently and he made the comment like, yeah, you know, when you sign up for the, for the left, you sign up for the losing team. You have to accept that, that you're going to be on the losing side. And then, so how, but how, how do you accept that and then still do the work? I mean, don't you, do you need to have, you know, it's like, um, you can't be a depressed revolutionary, can you? Yeah. I think most revolutionaries rise up. Hannah Arendt says, you know, never trust those people who say this shouldn't be done or this oughtn't to be done. Only trust those people who say I can't. Um, most revolutionaries throughout history don't succeed. Every once in a while they do. Most don't. Um, I mean, our greatest prophets, you mentioned two of them, Martin and Malcolm, were killed. Fred Hampton, 24 years old. Why? Because Fred was building alliances with the white working class in Chicago, uh, and that was something that the FBI was terrified of. Uh, so uh, it does. It is about sublime madness. Um, um, it is about the, you know, the... I asked Daniel Berrigan, the great radical priest who baptized my youngest daughter, you know, how do you define faith? And he said, it's it's the belief that the good draws to it the good, even if empirically everything around you says otherwise. And that's what faith is. It's the, what Kierkegaard would call the leap of faith. And so you believe it, even though if you don't have physical or empirical evidence to prove it. Although I think the good does draw to it the good. Um, I do what I do because of people like Berrigan, all those people, my father, who was a Presbyterian minister, a civil rights advocate, anti-war activist, a gay rights activist. His brother was gay. Uh, I can't betray those people, you know, those. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, I'm 63 now. The older you get, the you know, funny way, the more powerful those figures become in your life. Uh and, uh, you know, I, I worry a lot about the eco side. I have children. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I, it doesn't look good. Um, but I at least want them to look back and say that their father tried. Uh, and that's all we can do. Um, and uh, I, I don't share the culture's mania for hope. I, uh, I, I care more about you know, it, doing what's right insofar as I can determine what's right, maintaining relationships with people who are oppressed. I think too many liberals, the oppressed are an abstraction. If you can't walk out of that prison and be angry, you don't have a heart. Um, I can't keep quiet. I can't stop doing what I'm doing because people I care deeply about are, are sitting in a cage right now. And because of Corona, they're sitting in a cage 23 hours a day. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, oftentimes, you know, that's much of my drive and outspokenness about what's happening to Palestinians in Gaza because I have close relationships with people in Gaza. And I know whatever price I pay is nothing compared to what they endure. Uh, and I think that that 
act of human solidarity kind of transcends hope uh, and to somehow not stand up on behalf of these people and not cry out, you know, especially because their voices are often muzzled. Uh, just I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't live with myself. I, I, hear, I hear you. I, I don't I don't know how people can live with themselves. But anyway, Chris, it's been uh, amazing having you on. Thanks for being so generous with your time. Thanks for your work. Uh, thanks for doing the work uh, with that play. I can't wait to see it. And uh, and also thanks for the kind words you wrote about me in the introduction to Lee Camp's book. That was real. Oh, flattery. yeah, sure. So I really appreciate it. So everybody, uh, I'm, you're working on what's your next book? It's not mass incarceration. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Everybody check out his, uh, his latest book. It's called uh, America, the Farewell Tour, Chris Hedges. It tells you everything that's happening right now, the hollowing out of America and what the remnants of uh, this corporate coup d'etat is. It's not pretty, but somebody's documenting it, so thanks to Chris Hedges. Thanks again. It's great to thanks, have Jim. you. All right, thanks. <laughs> Hey, this is the part where I tell you where our live shows are, but there aren't any. <laughs> and then I would tell you to go join our premium, but, but nobody has a fucking job. So why don't you just enjoy the video?